Now you guys sprung for the good chalk. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, there's lots here too. Thank you. Oh, and lots of good colors also. Wait, is there a clock? Oh yes, there's a clock. Oh, and it's even forgivenly a few minutes behind. <laughs> okay, very good. Oh, Got wait, do you want to hear what an abelian differential is? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm ready to educate you then. <laughs> okay. Well, you'll miss the definition of the GL2 action. You'll <laughs> have to go on sadly ignorant. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's on. He said I was good. He said I didn't need to do anything. Okay. Okay, welcome back. Um, I'm more happy to introduce Alex Wright from the fourth floor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he'll give his first lecture on the deal who are actually on the fourth floor. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. I was almost late, but I rushed down the, the stairs. Um, <coughs> so the topic of the lecture series is the GL to our action on the Hodge bundle, but I'm gonna spend the first lecture just telling you what a point in the Hodge bundle is. Okay, and then in the next lecture, we'll talk about the GL to our action. And then on Friday, we'll get to some of the big theorems um, including uh, one of the theorems for which Mario Mirzakhani won the Fields Medal in 2014. Um, before I begin, I'd like to say I hope you all ask lots of questions. Uh, during the talks, after the talks, whenever. I'm really happy to get lots of questions. OK. Uh, so I'll start with, um, I'm going to give several definitions of a point in the Hodge bundle. And I'm going to start with sort of the more sophisticated definition, and then we're going to get to polygons uh, after that. So the first definition is an abelian differential is uh, omega on a Riemann surface x is a global section of the cotangent bundle. OK, so if you're an algebraic geometer, you're now very happy. I'm not sure if there are any algebraic geometers in the room. Um, so IE, it's a holomorphic one form. Uh, which is something that just locally looks like f of z dz. Uh, 
OK, so you've all dealt with differential forms before. So this is just a differential form, except it uh, uses complex coefficients instead of real coefficients. Um, and recall, the definition of a Riemann surface is just a surface with an atlas of charts to C. So the transitions are biholomorphic. Okay? So in one of those charts with a local coordinate C, the one form is just written f of z dz for a holomorphic function uh, f. OK? Um, so that's an abelian differential. And uh, we only care about the non-zero ones. Okay, so we'll, I'll say a translation surface x omega is a non-zero um, uh, abelian differential. OK. So. Um, well, that's a little bit abstract. How do we understand these things? Uh, the way we understand these things is by, by picking a local coordinate. So rather than getting an arbitrary holomorphic function, we get a very simple holomorphic function. So the proposition here is um, for any translation surface at any point on x, there is a local coordinate z so that omega is uh, z to the k dz for some uh, k. OK, so actually, the, the default value of k is 0. Uh, and at the, the points where there's a higher value of k, that's called the 0 of the differential. Okay? Um, and it turns out there are only finitely many points where the, the differential is 0. So really, usually, it looks like omega equals dz in some coordinate. And so that's the most important case. Um, so restricting to that case, if k equals 0, uh, this coordinate z is unique up to translations. OK. Um, so both parts of this are something you can try to prove on your own. And they're both uh, on the survey on my website that's also referenced in the abstract that I'm going to follow for these talks. Uh, the survey has a name like translation surfaces and their orbit closures, an introduction for a broad audience. Um, uh, they're not very hard to prove. You find the local coordinate essentially by integrating omega. Um, and the fact that uh, z is unique up to translations is basically the fact that if two functions have the same derivative, then they differ by a constant. <coughs> OK. Uh, so really, this is going to inform how we, we think about these things. Uh, at most points, there's a, a coordinate, a map to C, that's unique up to translations. And that's why it's called the translation surface. Uh, there is, however, this pesky set of points uh, where the abelian differential has a 0, where when you find this local coordinate, this k is positive. Um, and I'm going to let sigma denote that set of points. So this is a finite set of omega, and it's the set of zeros. And as a consequence of this underlined fact, um, we have the following. x minus sigma has an atlas of charts. You see whose transition maps are translations. OK, and uh, 
From this, we get a few things. So in particular, we get a flat metric, because there's a flat metric on C that's invariant under translations. Um, if you think about it carefully, you, you realize we get a little bit more than a flat metric. Um, there's a well-defined choice of north at every point of x minus sigma. Because the coordinates are well-defined up to translation, and translation preserves the northern direction. Okay, you could contrast this to um, an atlas of charts uh, that were um, just isometries of R2. So for example, uh, translations and rotations. If you had that, you'd still have a flat metric, but you wouldn't have a well-defined choice of north anymore. So. Um, but something is up with this finite set. Okay, and I should have emphasized um, every higher genus Riemann surface has lots of abelian differentials. Okay, every single one is a, for a genus G surface is a G-dimensional space of them. But we know a higher genus surface doesn't have a flat metric by Gauss-Bonnet. Okay, integ integral of curvature is the Euler characteristic. Um, and what happens is that these points, the zeros, are singularities of this flat metric. So sigma uh, is singularities of the metric. And I'll explain uh, what happens there in a second. Okay, is there a question? Uh, yeah, except for this finite set of points. Yep, yeah, you're right. So another way to think of it is we know that you can't have a nowhere vanishing vector field on the surface. And you almost do here except for this finite set of points. Is there another question? Is there a difference between this idea to put the north and like an orientation? Um, it's, it's stronger than an orientation. Okay, so for example, if we allowed uh, translations and rotations in the transition maps, you'd still get an orientable surface because rotations are, are orientation preserving, but you wouldn't have a choice of north. Um, yep? Yeah, yeah, it's a tangent vector at every point, except for these finitely many points where you have a singularity. Was there another question over here? OK. <clears throat> so now I want to tell you what's going on at these special points. And it's nothing mysterious. It's something you can just write down and understand very concretely. OK. So, so near a 0 of order. Okay. okay, so in other words, one of the points where we have a coordinate that looks like z to the k dz uh, with k bigger than 0. Um, so we know what omega looks like algebraically, but what does it look like geometrically? Somehow there's this flat metric on the surface, and you know I should understand what that metric looks like near this point. Um, so omega looks like, like, well, um, to answer the question, what does it look like? It's very helpful to come up with a more geometric way of, of getting this abelian differential. And you can get this abelian differential by pulling back the abelian differential dz under the map um, z goes to z to the k plus 1. Up, up to a constant. So uh, omega looks like the flat, I'm going to write that down, the flat metric on C um, pulled back by Z maps to Z to the K plus 1. Okay, so if you take the, the form dz and you pull it back by this map, you get uh, this form up to a constant. Yep? Um, you can't get rid of these zeros uh, by passing to a finite cover. 
Is, does that answer your question? Well, you, can't. you can't. Yeah. And in a sense, you can make them worse by passing to a finite cover, but you can't make them better. Okay. Uh, as we'll sort of see here, because we have the usual metric on C, and we're going to sort of pull it back via this branch <coughs> cover, z goes to z to the k plus 1. Okay, so this, this observation relates the geometry to something we can understand, because I certainly understand the flat metric on C, and I certainly understand the map z goes to z to the k plus 1. Okay, so I should now be able to somehow draw a picture for you that somehow looks like k plus 1 copies of the the complex plane sort of uh, twirling around. Um, and I'll, I'll do that now. Uh, so I'll choose to draw this like this. So I, I'm going to choose um, to, to build a picture of what it looks like near this point by gluing together a bunch of half planes. OK, so here I've taken uh, four half planes, okay, which if you'd like is two copies of C. But I'm not going to glue them together so they form two copies of C. I'm going to glue them together so they form a, a two-fold branch cover of C. And you do that uh, like this. So a, A, B, B, C, C, D. D. OK, so this is sort of. I, it's sort of spiraling around this point. You have two copies of C. Um, and this is for the map uh, z goes to z squared. Uh, and so this is a 0 of order 1. This is the case k equals 1. Okay, and locally, the abelian differential, the flat metric, just looks like a bunch of copies of the half plane glued together uh, in a cycle. Okay, so you get. Uh, k plus 1 um, half planes. Uh, so 2k plus 1, k plus 1 upper half planes, and k plus 1 lower half planes um, glued together. And together, um, they make a cone angle of uh, 2 times k plus 1 pi. Okay, so you would all agree that each half plane has a, an angle of pi uh, around this point. And when you glue them together, that means there's a, an angle of 2k plus 1 pi. Um, and the way I remember that is uh, every k sort of contributes an extra 2 pi of angle. You know, there's always a default of 2 pi angle. And then you add on an, ever, an extra 2 pi angle every time you increase k by 1. So uh, you really have only one local picture for each k. Questions? OK, so this brings us to the second definition of a translation surface, that being the first one. So a translation surface is a surface x with a finite set sigma, so x minus sigma has an atlas of charts to C whose transition maps are translations. Translations. Um, and for each point of sigma, there is some k bigger than zero such that a neighborhood of that point. Um, is isometric to the picture I drew above. To the, let me just call it the 2k 
plus 1 half plane construction. So this is our second definition. And if I'm giving multiple definitions, I better at least sketch why they're equivalent. OK, so proposition, um, definitions 1 and 2 are equivalent. OK, so we've actually proven part of this, because we showed that if you have an abelian differential up there, you get this structure. Okay, you get this atlas of charts, etc. So now I should say, if you have this atlas of charts, etc., why do you get an abelian? Uh, why do you get an abelian differential on a Riemann surface? Okay, and and the proof is not so hard. So proof. Um, so translations are um, by holomorphisms. By holomorphisms and this implies that x minus sigma is a Riemann surface. In other words, it's a surface with an atlas of charts to see whose transition maps are by holomorphisms. Okay, with a little work, um, you can uh, extend this. Uh, to the finite set of points. Okay, and I, I do that in, in detail in the notes. Um, so it's, you know, x is a Riemann surface. So now you just need to say what the abelian differential is, uh, but you just set that to be dz in one of the, the, the charts describing x minus sigma. And again, you have to sort of check carefully what happens at the finite set of points, which is in the notes, but I'm not going to do for you here. Questions? Okay, otherwise, uh, let's proceed directly to the third definition, um, which I think is actually the friendliest definition of, of a translation surface. Um, so a translation surface is a collection of polygons in C um, with pairs of edges identified by translations. Up to some cut and paste uh, equivalence relation that I'll describe. OK, so uh, before I describe this in detail, though, let me give an example. Um, so uh, this is probably the easiest translation surface, one of uh, the ones that many of you will have come across before. If you take the complex plane modulo, the lattice Z2, um, this is a Riemann surface, this is a torus. Uh, and because the differential dz on C is invariant by translations, it extends to an abelian differential uh, on the torus. Now, none of you will be surprised when I tell you you can think of this as a square um, with opposite edges identified, the square being a fundamental domain for the action of Z, uh, Z2 on C. So this is an example uh, of how to draw a translation surface um, uh, with polygons. But also, you won't be surprised if I tell you that that surface is the same as this one. What I've done to go from one to the other is I've sort of cut this, and I've moved it over here. It's just evidently exactly the same surface. I've just presented it differently using polygons. Okay, so this is very much um, 
in the spirit of this definition. So more formally, the, the edges you identify, they have to be the same length and parallel. They have to be identified so that you get sort of bits of surface on either side. Okay, so I couldn't, if I had sort of a polygon that looked like, I don't know, something weird like this, I couldn't identify this side with this side, right? Because they would sort of, the surface is on the same side of that edge. Um, uh, and every pe edge has to be paired with exactly one other. Okay? And in other words, this is what you require to get a closed surface out of it. Um, now, as for the equivalence relation, here's what you're allowed to do. You have all of these polygons. You could have one. You could have more than one. You're allowed, first of all, to sort of translate them around in the complex plane, because that evidently doesn't change the surface. Okay? If you have two of them sitting right next to each other, sharing an edge, you're allowed to cut that and declare it to be two polygons with those edges identified. Okay? So I could, for example, just cut this and sort of draw it like this. Um, no big deal. Vice versa, if you have two polygons that are different sharing an edge, you can just sort of delete that and say it's all one polygon. Okay, and this combines to give you the equivalence relation uh, for which different sort of polygonal presentation should give you the same surface. Um, and it's probably worth noting that I use the word presentation. I think this is very much like a presentation of a group with generators and relations. Okay, you have some abstract object, um, and you're sort of giving some concrete way of writing it, and there are many different ways of, of writing it in that way. Okay, uh, and another example. So this is a very special example because the set uh, sigma is empty. Okay, this, this no singularities to the metric, but uh, I should give you an example where it's not empty. And the example I give will be the regular octagon with opposite sides identified. Okay, And uh, when you think about translation surfaces, you get good really quickly at um, following various identifications along, for example, to figure out how many vertices there really are. Because there actually aren't eight vertices here. And let me show you. You start with this one. And this edge is identified with this edge. So on the surface, this point is the same as this point. And similarly, this point is the same as this point. And if you sort of follow it around, you'll actually see that uh, all of the corners are the same point on the surface. And so that, um, if you add up the angles, you'll see that there's a, a 6 pi angle there. If you just take whatever this angle is and multiply it by uh, 8, you'll get there's a 6 pi angle there. So certainly, that's the singularity of the metric. Okay, there's something weird going on there. OK, so once again, I owe you some sort of. Uh, yeah, so I'm actually about to. So I'm, but I'm going to, I've already explained that the first and second definitions are equivalent. So now I'm going to sketch to you why the second and third definitions are equivalent. OK, and to do that, I need a definition of something called the saddle connection. So a saddle connection. Um, is a straight line uh, segment joining uh, two singularities. Now, singularities are these points of, of sigma. They're the zeros of the abelian differential. Um, so it actually doesn't have to be two distinct points. It could be one point in itself. So there is a saddle connection. It's just a line on the surface. Okay? Here's another saddle connection. Okay, by, by definition, you don't allow the saddle connection to have any points of sigma on its interior. Okay, so it's just a, a segment with no other points of sigma on its interior. Um, and I'll use this to sort of briefly indicate why the definitions are the same. I was trying to figure out why you 
you know, you don't, for the figure that you erased, you didn't allow a translation like that. Does a translation have to be in a perpendicular direction to the edge? Nope. Nope. Then, so what was the defining thing of why these translations, like those side identifications are allowed and not the other ones? That oh, oh, so, um, yeah, let me draw a little example. Um, Okay, so let me draw something that's allowed and not allowed. So first of all, something that's not allowed. Um, okay, so I can't, so say I identify this with this, that with that, and that with that, those are okay. But then I try to identify this with this, and this with this. Sorry, this might be too small for some of you in the back to see. So I'm identifying this with this. Okay, this one is not allowed. Why? Because what you want to happen is you want two pieces to sort of go together like this. What's happening here is you have two pieces that are sort of coming together like this at a fold. Okay, so you could think about that sort of surface, but we're just, that's not part of the definition. Okay? What is allowed is I could have just um, uh, done something like, you know, just about anything else. So I could have done the same thing, but I could have said 4, 4, 5, 5. Okay, then these aren't sort of perpendicularly opposite from each other. That, you know, is, is fine. But they still, if I look at like a piece here and a piece here, they sort of fit together to make sort of a flat piece of paper rather than a folded piece of paper. Okay. Other questions? Can you, do, I mean, can you understand that given a Turing pattern? Uh huh. And checking, what do you check to know if that Turing pattern will indeed give you uh, allow in the surface? Oh, I mean, it's just very easy. You you have to glue parallel edges, and um, the surface has to be on opposite sides of the edges. Uh huh. Right, so, so I didn't see what that contradicts in the definition. Well, I didn't write out the definition in a really detailed way, <laughs> but this is part of the definition. The definition is written in a really detailed way. I mean, if you want to somehow be very formal about it, you could say that. Um, each edge of the polygon has sort of an inward pointing normal vector field. Okay? And when you glue two edges, you, the, the normal pointing vector fields has to be in sort of opposite directions. Uh, I, I think it's just easier to say, though, you want them. So you want to be able to take a piece of one and a piece of the other so they just give you like a neighborhood in C uh, rather than sort of a folded copy of C. Yeah? That's right. You won't preserve north if you do that. It depends on how you glue, actually. Like you, in fact, um, yeah. I mean, you could glue via rotation, or you could glue just via a translation like this. And the translation would preserve north, but we don't want it. Um, it wouldn't actually. So you wouldn't get an orientable surface. Is I think what would happen. Because uh, you'd essentially be gluing by a reflection. You, yeah, you wouldn't preserve east. <laughs> okay, other questions? Okay, so I want to, again, briefly uh, sketch why um, these two definitions are equivalent. And again, one direction is fairly easy. I think it's fairly clear that if you build a surface out of polygons in this way, uh, then you'll get this, this structure. Okay? And again, maybe that's, why, maybe that's one explanation for why you don't allow this sort of gluing, because you, you wouldn't get that structure. Um, uh, but then what's a little bit harder is to see why every translation surface with definition 2 gives you a translation surface with definition 3. Okay. So uh, definitions... Two and three are equivalent. So proof sketch. 
Um, so we're going to start with definition two. Uh, what we'll do is we'll cut the surface along a maximal set of saddle connections with disjoint interiors. So already I'm like spawning exercises for you to think about. Why does a translation surface, as in definition two, have a saddle connection? That's a good thing to think about it. You can show it by starting at one of these uh, singularities and sort of growing a ball outwards. Eventually that ball will bump up against another singularity, maybe the same singularity. And when that happens, you'll have found a saddle connection. OK. Um, uh, so when you do this, you get a set of triangles. So here are more exercises. So say I cut along all these saddle connections. What can I get? Okay. Well, it's clear, for example, you couldn't get a piece that was some sort of quadrilateral, because otherwise there's another saddle connection. Okay. And it's also possible to show that the piece can't actually have any topology, um, or else you'd be able to find a saddle connection. So as I said, I'm spawning exercises for you to, to think about. Um, OK. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say about why you get polygons um, from the, uh, the second definition. I want to briefly say. Uh, the other direction. So given definition 3. So as I said, it's mostly clear why you get this. But um, uh, in fact, I think it's entirely clear. But I'd like to comment anyways on why you get a choice of north, okay, which is technically not part of that uh, definition, but is um, uh, sort of implicit in that definition. Um, or really what I mean to say is why do you get singularities where you have uh, an angle of pi which is integral? Okay, Because here we're not really saying what the singularities look like. So what I mean to say is wh why do you get sort of singularities where you have an integral multiple of 2 pi? Why an integral multiple of uh, of 2 pi at each cone point. OK, and it's, it's sort of easier to just do an example of something where that doesn't have an integral multiple of 2 pi. OK, so here's the Pac-Man. Okay, the Pac-Man is I just took some uh, segment, some sort of Pac-Man shape, and I'll identify these two rays via rotation. Okay, this is how you build a cone point whose uh, cone angle is less than 2 pi. Okay, so it just looks like this. It's sort of just like I've snipped off this bit of my paper, and I get a cone point. So why couldn't this happen? Um, well, it's because you have this, this choice of north. If you sort of started with a choice of north here, you could sort of walk around on the surface and sort of take your choice of north with you, and everything would be fine until you get here, and then you have to do this rotation to identify this to this. Uh, and when you do that, that would sort of, uh, sort of skew your choice of north. OK. So. Uh, what I'm saying is because of this definition, it's clear that you have this choice of north at every point. And because of the choice of north, you get uh, cone angles that are integral multiples of pi. OK, so that's the three definitions. Yep. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes, that's that's what this argument is. Uh huh. Well, um, then there's sort of nothing to prove. So what I was trying to prove is that at the singular points, um, which in this definition is, is sort of uh, manifested by the corners of the polygons. Those are the points where you don't have uh, this, uh, these nice uh, translation, uh, translation coordinates. Um, so I'm just trying to show at those special points that you have uh, an integral multiple of pi cone angle, because that's part of definition two. Okay, so I need to do this if I'm going to show definition three implies definition two. If there are no cone points, fine, that's okay. The, in this definition, this set sigma is allowed to be empty. But it's a very special case, because as we discussed, that actually only happens on genus one surfaces. Other questions? OK. So uh, some more um, examples. So here's one that I drew before, but I want to sort of generalize it to give a whole class of examples. So I drew something like this. And you could do whatever identification you want. Maybe this time I'll just do opposite edge identifications. OK. Uh, so here's a translation surface that I built out of squares. So it's called a square tiled surface. Um, and every square tiled surface comes equipped with a map to the torus, which is just you pile all the squares on top of each other. Okay, and that uh, map is branched over exactly one point represented by the corners of the squares. Um, uh, so if you want to be a little bit more symbolic about this, you can say that uh, this, as we know, is C mod C adjoint I with the one form DZ. This map uh, will be, in particular, a branched covering of Riemann surfaces. And the differential here will be the pullback of DZ on the torus. So that's one example. Yep. So this map will include some of the glue wings that you didn't want before. Uh, no. Are you, as you're piling all, up all the squares on top of each other, you'll be gluing the leftmost one to the rightmost one, and or the leftmost edge is the rightmost edge. And it's OK, because they're identified sort of uh, the surfaces on the left of one instance of that edge and the right on the other instance of that edge, which if you look here, I mean, you have the same thing. Uh, OK, so these are great because you can sort of build them all day long, and they're combinatorial. Okay, so people write combinatorial papers studying uh, these. You can represent them with discrete data. Um, but now I want to give you some examples that will uh, include all surfaces, all translation surfaces of genus 2. And I won't be able to do this for higher genus, so I hope you appreciate the genus 2 case. Um, so we all know the way to build a genus 2 surface is by connect summing two genus 1 surfaces. Okay, that's how you build up more complicated surfaces. You do connect sums. And it turns out there is a version of that for translation surfaces. And I'm going to present it to you now. So this is called the slit torus construction. So I'm going to take two tori. So there's one. Maybe I'll draw a weirder shaped one. There's another. OK. And then um, I'm going to cut them. I'm going to make a slit in each that's the same length in the same direction. I don't care where you put the slit. Um, and although it's a little bit confusing, I'm going to draw uh, the slit as two edges, because you know you cut a piece of paper and then there are two sides. So it's like you've 
this isn't you know 100% metrically accurate, but it's sort of symbolically clear what's going on. Um, and then I'm going to identify the edges. Okay, so this blue one will get identified with this blue one, and this uh, yellow one will get identified with this yellow one. Okay, and in so doing, I get a genus two translation surface. And it will have two singularities of the metric, one at this point and the other at that point. Okay. Now, it, you might object that you know, it wasn't really allowed in the third definition that you had in the middle of a polygon. Okay? To which I'll respond, either use definition two um, or get at your scissors and cut it up more. Okay, if you want to, like, cut, cut, and then sort of detach this, and you can, you know, make yourself happier by uh, expressing it as more polygons. Um, okay, so is this this clear? You said the, the, the two points are singularities. Yes. Um, so it is once you get the hang of it. So what you should always do in these pictures is trace through the identifications of the points. So because this is identified here, this point is the same as this point. Okay, and you can see it's not the same as this point, but these two points are the same. And then what you do is you just count up the cone angle. So there's 2 pi cone angle here and 2 pi angle here, but this is the, all the same point. So that means there's 4 pi angle around there. So ultimately, yes, it's obvious that it's a singularity because there's 4 pi angle there. Okay, any other questions? So there's also a slight variant of this, which looks like this. I'll take my torus, and I'll make the slit. But now, um, what I'm going to glue in is a cylinder. OK, so this, I took a sort of this is a rectangle with two sides identified. So it's a cylinder. And I have these two. Uh, two boundary parts of the slit, and so I'll glue one to one part and one to the other. Of course, I can't do it without crumpling up my paper. Um, and when you do this, it's a little bit different. So let's again follow through the identification of the edges. OK, so this point is identified with this point, okay? because this edge, uh, this edge is identified with that edge. But then this edge is identified with that edge, so that's the same point. Okay, and then that's identified here, and then so actually these are all the same point. And this, if you add it up, has six pi angle, whereas this had two pi angle and two pi angle. But you can actually check this is again a genus two surface. Okay, one way to do that is to sort of bend your brain and try to think about this as a surface. I actually don't recommend that. These surfaces want to be left alone in the plane. They don't want you to try to like, pick them up and like, actually make them into surfaces. Um, the other way is there's a version of gauss bonnet that holds for these surfaces. Okay, so gauss bonnet says the Euler characteristic is the integral of the curvature. So here, the curvature has point masses at each singularity. And what happens is each extra 2 pi of angle counts as 1 of negative curvature. So here I have a 6 pi, which is two extra 2 pi's of angle. Okay, so that contributes 2, which is the Euler characteristic, or minus the Euler characteristic. And here, each of these points, I have 4 pi angle. And 4 pi angle is 1 extra 2 pi, because we all know there's supposed to be 2 pi to start with. So here I got 1 plus 1 is 2, which is minus the Euler characteristic. And that you can prove just with combinatorics. Okay. Should I stop now? OK, uh, we'll take a break now. <laughs>